section eight of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter four from the gracchi to sulla part three victorious thus far drusus then began an agitation to prepare the people for the second part of his programme the great law which was in his idea to regenerate the roman people by introducing into the citizen body the great mass of italian allies aware of the difficulties of the task he got into communication with the chief men in each state throughout the peninsula they visited his house and formed an association for the purpose of pushing their claims it is said that in every country town there was a branch started whose members swore to live and die with drusus to spend life and fortune in behalf of him and of all other brethren who had taken the oath and to enlist in the bond every possible helper to institute such a society was to go perilously near the edge of conspiracy and of high treason and its framer can hardly have supposed that he had made the oath harmless and constitutional by adding a clause in which the members bound themselves when they had received the franchise to regard rome as their fatherland and drusus as their patron the association was soon well rooted in every corner of the land and provided the italians with the bond of organization and the common executive whose want had hitherto been their weakness drusus had not been wrong in thinking that the proposal to enfranchise the allies would shake the allegiance of many of his followers and gain him bitter enemies both in the senate and in the urban multitude there were many who began to fall away from him when he insisted on the necessity of this great measure after a time he lost control of the senate and a majority in it voted that his first set of laws had been invalid owing to the informal way in which they had been passed en bloc under a single preamble but the resolution of the haughty tribune was not in the least shaken he announced his intention of persisting with his schemes in spite of all opposition he made no attempt to dispute the legality of the senate's decision as to his laws but determined to bring forward the question of the italians how far he would have carried the matter we cannot tell for one evening as he was returning to his own house after making a harangue in the forum he was murdered a multitude was pressing around him when he was seen to stumble and fall he had been stabbed in the groin with a cobbler's knife which was found sticking in the wound within a few hours he was dead and all his plans perished with him his enemies of the equestrian order succeeded in getting a bill passed by the comitia to the effect that the association which he had formed had been treasonable and that both his friends in the senate and his chief agents among the allies should be prosecuted for conspiracy the news that drusus had been murdered and that a special commission had been appointed to try his supporters was the signal for the outbreak of rebellion all over italy the chief men of all the allied cities had learnt to know each other in the reformer's house and had ascertained that they all had the same grievances and the same desires the desperate meaning to the italians of the present crisis was that they had now ascertained that neither party in the roman state would ever help them they had long supposed that they might count on the aid of the democrats for both the gracchi and saturninus had promised them relief the optimates as they had supposed were their enemies but now the best of the optimates had taken up their cause drusus had been supported by men such as crassus the orator aurelius cotta and the aged marcus aemilius scaurus the princep senatus it was the main body of the democratic party and its allies the equites who had foiled the plans of drusus the urban multitude in its narrow jealousy had deserted him lest it might lose some portion of its shows and its corn doles the tribune varius who had proposed the bill against the friends of drusus was a well-known democrat and his chief supporters were equites realizing that the democracy was really as hostile to them as the most bigoted conservative in the optimate party the italians saw that they could only hope to gain their rights by unsheathing the sword <laughs> 
within three months of the death of drusus the whole peninsula from picinum southward was in arms few states save the latin colonies continued faithful to the roman cause with the details of the fierce but confused campaign which raged all over italy during the years b c ninety to eighty nine it is not necessary to deal the odds were against rome the sturdy yeomen of the apennine valleys were individually better men than the town-bred legions whom the consuls lucius caesar and rutilius lupus sent against them it must be confessed however that the romans fought far better than might have been expected even the urban multitude displayed a savage determination worthy of their ancestors and offered to give up even their cherished corn dole in the day of necessity but the citizens were opposed by superior numbers their officers were for the most part incapable the campaign presented a thousand difficulties because of the necessity of endeavouring to relieve the many outlying garrisons latin colonies for the most part in remote corners of italy if rome was not crushed in the first year of the war it was because she still retained many advantages she had the undisputed command of the sea and by means of it could send succours round the peninsula even when the central lines of communication were held by the enemy the provinces fortunately for her did not choose this moment to revolt from them she drew not only numerous auxiliary troops but also the ample supply of money and food by which alone the war could be maintained the revolted italians were terribly handicapped by their poverty rome had also a considerable number of officers headed by marius himself who were accustomed to commanding and moving large bodies of men none of the italian generals had ever headed any force larger than a cohort and they had to learn the art of handling armies numbered by tens of thousands without any previous experience but the most important factor of all in the struggle was that rome represented unity of action and organization as opposed to a heterogeneous mass of tribes of very different races divided by local interests and old grudges the italians did not succeed in setting up a vigorous federal government the constitution which they devised for themselves was a slavish and stupid imitation of that of rome which failed to give them either a vigorous executive or a capable administrative council yet in spite of all these advantages the experiences of the first year of war so tried the strength of rome and broke down her haughty spirit that she practically consented to grant the allies the franchise which they had demanded the lex julia passed in the winter of b c ninety gave the citizenship to all the italian communities who had remained faithful including the whole of the populous latin colonies having once surrendered the principle for which they had entered on the war the romans did not hesitate to go farther only two or three months after the lex julia had been enacted there followed the still more important lex plautia papiria which granted the franchise to every individual italian who should lay down his arms and appear before a magistrate to crave enrolment as a roman citizen this law saved the existence of rome at the sacrifice of her old claim to dominate italy as a mistress the rebels flocked in by tens of thousands to give in their names and to take up the long coveted status of citizen the power of the insurrection was so much thinned that the second campaign of the war that of b c eighty nine went almost entirely in favour of the romans district after district was subdued and at the end of the year only the obstinate samnites and the less important tribes of lucania remained in arms it was clear that the fate of the war had been decided and that the crushing of the last desperate rebels could only be a matter of time the romans once more breathed freely and contented to have saved the existence of the city and the empire contemplated with comparative equanimity the crowd of new citizens with whom for the future they had to share the dominion of the world at this moment the most inappropriate one that could have been chosen for samnium had still to be subdued and a great foreign war with king mithridates was just breaking out civil strife recommenced at rome the conduct of the two parties was absolutely insane there is no parallel for it in history save one 
the state of france in seventeen ninety three to four when foreign invasion domestic insurrection and bloody proscriptions in the capital were all in progress at once bears much similarity to the state of italy in b c eighty eight to eighty seven that civil war should arise when every man and every sesterce was still wanted to preserve the state from dangerous external troubles is all the more astonishing because in b c eighty eight both the optimate and democratic parties were in a deep state of discredit no one could say that the rule of the senate during the last thirty years had been anything but feeble and incompetent on the other hand all the main items of the democratic program had been tried and found wanting the agrarian and colonial schemes of the gracchi had failed to regenerate the state farming was as unprofitable as ever the corn dole of gaius gracchus had been in working order for a whole generation and had been carried to its logical extreme by saturninus and drusus yet the urban population was as miserable and as discontented as ever the franchise had now been granted to the italians who had obtained possession of every personal immunity and political privilege that they could wish save indeed that they had been enrolled in eight tribes only so that their voting power in the comitia was not fully equivalent to their numbers but it had always been the practical advantages of citizenship rather than the right to register their suffrages that they had desired but a party does not necessarily cease to exist because its program is played out more especially a party of criticism and discontent such as that of the roman populares they were if anything more violent than they had ever been before and though all the constructive items in their political creed had been tried and had proved futile so that nothing really remained of it save the single destructive cry of down with the senate but if no longer a party with measures they were now a party with men the great civil war that was approaching was to show that the personal ambitions of a marius a sulpicius or a cinna supplied enough of a war cry to unite the turbulent elements in rome and that the populares could continue to exist even without a popular program hitherto all the really important constitutional and economic quarrels between optimates and democrats had been fought out by mere rioting and chance medley but now a fierce and prolonged civil war which was to put scores of legions in the field was to follow on a mere personal rivalry for a military command a tribune named sulpicius rufus to whom the mantle of saturninus had descended was busy in formulating some new reforms of second-rate importance the most prominent of them was a bill for distributing the freedmen who had hitherto been confined to the four city tribes and the new italian citizens who had in a similar way been told off to eight tribes only among the whole of the old constituencies there was no great point in the bill so far as the italians were concerned for they would rarely have ever come up to vote on account of the mere difficulties of distance as to the freedmen they were the worst element in the state and to propose to give them more power in the comitia than they already enjoyed was the act of the most unscrupulous demagogy sulpicius as it would seem was a man from whom such legislation might be expected we have no unbiased account of his character and his plans but the records which his enemies have left behind paint him in the most lurid colours he was inferior to none in desperate attempts writes plutarch inspired by some optimate authority he was a compound of cruelty insolence and avarice and could commit the most infamous crimes in cold blood he openly sold the citizenship of rome to persons who had been slaves and received their money told out on a table in the forum he always went about with a band of three hundred armed satellites and had a council of young equites whom he called his anti-senate though he got a law passed that every man who owed more than two thousand denarii should be expelled from the senate he had debts himself to the amount of three millions there seems no doubt that he could vie in ruffianly violence with saturninus and glaucia several times he cleared his adversaries out of the comitia with staves and daggers on one occasion it is said he tried to murder the consuls pompeius and sulla during the actual session of the assembly the son of the former was killed in this desperate riot 
however exaggerated may be the language of plutarch it is at least clear that sulpicius was a man of violent and unscrupulous character but for the moment he had control of the streets and the assembly and it was to him that those who had something to gain addressed themselves accordingly it does not surprise us to find him adding to the many laws which he passed one intended for the private and personal benefit of one of his friends it was a decree appointing gaius marius to the command of the army which was to be sent to the east to repel king mithridates the old general had recovered from the shock of his political humiliation in b c ninety nine he had been entrusted with a considerable body of legions during the italian war and had fought with success against the rebels though he had not gained any very striking victories he felt that he was only half rehabilitated in the eyes of his fellow-citizens and was anxious to close his career with a series of brilliant campaigns which should cause them to forget the names of saturninus and glaucia the king of pontus was he thought the kind of enemy who would provide a roman general with the opportunity of winning a sensational triumph annexing whole provinces and accumulating untold stores of plunder and trophies if he returned to rome laden with the spoils of the east he would once more occupy the commanding position in the state which he had enjoyed at the end of the cimbric war the army which was destined for the asiatic campaign was at present lying under the walls of nola the last fortress in the lowlands which was still in the hands of the rebellious samnites but it was believed that the place would soon fall and then the six legions which formed the besieging force would be disposable for service overseas they were at present under the command of the consul lucius cornelius sulla to whom the charge of the mithridatic war had been duly assigned by the senate he was a prominent member of the optimate party and an old enemy of marius in displacing him the aged general would not merely secure the command of the best roman army then existing but would also disappoint and humiliate a personal foe accordingly marius allied himself to sulpicius rufus and paid his enormous debts while in return the tribune passed the decree which deprived sulla of his army they little knew the manner of man they were provoking their bill was to cost one of them his life and to cause the other to be hunted out of italy and driven into a miserable exile they had stirred up into action the most capable and the most relentless enemy that democracy was ever to know end of section eight section nine of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter five sulla part one lucius cornelius sulla the man whom sulpicius and marius had so recklessly challenged to mortal combat is one of the most striking figures in roman history for mere psychological interest there is no one who can be compared with him save caesar alone he combined in the most extraordinary degree the old roman political virtues with the personal vices that the new rome had borrowed from the hellenized east to his credit it must be granted that throughout his career he displayed the main qualities which had distinguished those generations of men who had built up the roman domination in italy during the fourth and third centuries before christ he had an enormous sense of the dignity and importance of the roman name the welfare of the state as he conceived it stood before any private or party interest he was entirely lacking in personal as opposed to national ambition the crown and the purple robe had no attraction for him in this respect he must be reckoned superior even to caesar who was not insensible to such things nor was he affected by the more insidious craving for power he was one of those rare spirits who after they have achieved the highest things and risen to practical sovereignty in the state are content to step down from the throne and to retire into private life moreover he had the solid military ability the steadfast level-headed perseverance the freedom from vain theory 
which had distinguished the best men of the elder days of the republic mixed with these old roman characteristics were all the vices of the decadent half hellenized generation into which he had been born sulla had learnt to be regardless of human life not merely of the lives of aliens or barbarians most romans were that but of the lives of citizens also if a man great or small stood in way of his schemes or his reforms he doomed that man to perish with entire nonchalance he had the most profound belief in the all-importance of the roman state but the sacrosanctity of the individual citizen seemed to him a farce the old shibboleth kiwis romanus sum had no protective power against his ruthless hand another modern trait of his character which could only have come from the habitual study of destructive and doubting greek philosophy was a frank disregard for the law of the constitution a thing for which the old roman had as slavish a reverence as had his contemporary the pharisee for the letter of the law of moses while other men still wrangled over forms and ceremonies vetoes and auspices sulla quietly marched an army against rome and showed that neither religious sanctions nor tribunitial mandates had any power to stop a commander with loyal troops at his back sulla had a supreme contempt for forms that had grown meaningless though the majority of the men of his generation were still in bondage to them very un-roman again was another of sulla's characteristics a smooth plausible utterly hollow urbanity the deceptive courtesy of the diplomat the roman of the elder republic had been brutally straightforward his notion of diplomacy was summed up in the two handfuls of peace and war which fabius offered to the carthaginian senate or in the line which popilius linus drew around the astonished antiochus epiphanes sulla on the other hand took an artistic pleasure in circumventing and cajoling those with whom he had to deal to outmanoeuvre jugurtha at bocchus's court to talk round the parthian ambassador whom his master afterwards executed for being so outwitted were great delights to him to outdo the wily barbarian in his own field of lies had an intrinsic pleasure in the execution another and most unamiable side of sulla's disposition may be summed up in saying that he was an epicurean both in the best and the worst sense of the word he had a keen enjoyment of artistic and intellectual pleasures he loved beautiful things for their own sake was an enlightened student of literature and appreciated and collected hellenic works of art he liked to converse with philosophers and authors with actors and artists and willingly sharpened his brains and increased his knowledge of every side of life by mixing with all sorts and conditions of men but at the same time he had the bad side of the artistic temperament he was frankly vicious in his private life as evil a liver as any greek tyrant of old he was perfectly destitute of any sense of chastity or shame and moreover habitually indulged to excess in the banquet and the wine-cup this it was that ruined his splendid constitution and turned his handsome face into the mulberry spotted with meal to which it was compared in his middle age to complete this strange and repulsive character we must add a curious strain of wild superstition of the simple and stolid religiosity of the old roman there was no trace in him but like napoleon he believed in his star though as far as deeds went he was a scoffer yet he professed a belief that he was the chosen tool of the gods venus he said was his special patroness and gave him good fortune he sometimes called himself in gratitude epaphroditus he claimed to have dreams omens and premonitions he took his surnames the adjectives felix and faustus the lucky his most hazardous steps were made as he said under direct inspiration from above he wrote in his autobiography that his resolutions taken on the spur of the moment and his enterprises begun without any proper preparation always succeeded far better than those on which he had bestowed the most time and forethought we might perhaps have imagined that he assumed this role of the favourite of fortune merely to encourage his followers 
had it not been that he carried it into private life when no end was to be gained by proceeding with the farce there seems to have been a genuine fantastic vein of superstition in this otherwise practical and cynical mind we know for example that on battle days he wore under his corslet a small golden image of apollo which he had got at delphi but the strangest development of his beliefs was yet to be told on his deathbed when one would have expected that his mind should have been filled with the memory of all the horrors that he had committed he was visited with comforting visions he told his friends that he faced the other world with equanimity for his dead wife and son had appeared to him and had bidden him hasten to join them in a life of perfect rest and happiness beyond the grave truly this was a strange ending for the blood-stained author of the proscriptions of b c eighty one sulla had spent his youth in dire poverty his family was ancient but impoverished no man of this branch of the cornelii had held curule office for six generations he had not even a paternal mansion or a hearth of his own but lived as we learn from plutarch in a set of lodgings one story removed from the garret and hired at the meagre rent of three thousand sesterces about twenty-six pounds per annum he was a man who yearned after all the comforts and elegacies of life who loved good dinners good wine and other less reputable luxuries and who in his youth could not get them it is this poverty of his early years that accounts for his insatiable addiction to pleasure in middle age when most men have lost their taste for frivolity he was making up for the enjoyments of which he had been defrauded in his young days men of the type of sulla able impecunious and destitute of any family influence were generally the stuff from which demagogues were made there are a dozen instances in roman history of young and penniless aristocrats who started on the career of mob leader and champion of the rabble it was the easiest trade on which to embark if one loved notoriety had no scruples and lacked wealthy relatives to push one forward but sulla was above all things an aristocrat he loathed the urban multitude and all its works and when he put himself forward as a candidate for the quaestorship in b c one o seven it was as a strict optimate how such a poor and unknown young man ever succeeded in obtaining a magistracy we do not know that he was able and eloquent is clear enough but a full purse or a programme of confiscation and corn doles was a much better commendation to the electors than mere ability how one who was an optimate and yet had not the money to buy his way to power got his foot on the first rung of the ladder that led to the consulship it is hard to conceive but the feat was accomplished sulla became quaestor and served under marius in numidia during the last year of the jugurthine war one o six to one o five it was here that he won his first distinction and earned the undying enmity of his superior in command while the struggle with the evasive numidian seemed likely to drag on for ever sulla suddenly brought it to an end by his clever and unscrupulous diplomacy by a combination of bribes and cajolery he induced bacchus the moor jugurtha's chief ally to kidnap his guest and relative and to hand him over in chains to the romans the war came to an end and marius took the credit to himself but he was well aware that sulla had really brought it to a finish the quaestor made no attempt to disguise the fact he took as the device of his signet ring a picture of jugurtha surrendered by bacchus himself and he persuaded the moor to dedicate on the roman capital a group of statues reproducing the same composition marius was bitterly vexed it was probably for this reason that sulla took a particular pride in the statues they were placed long after as the device on cornelian coins we may still see sulla in his chair the captive numidian king in chains before him and the moor in front waving the olive branch with which he sued for peace with rome once launched on an official career sulla came steadily to the front his only drawback was his want of funds the first time that he stood for the praetorship he was rejected because the people had expected from him and had not received a great show of african wild beasts but finding money necessary he finally succeeded in scraping it together partly as spoils of war 
partly in less obvious and reputable ways his public services however were distinguished in the highest degree nothing that he took in hand failed to come to a good end already the luck on which he was so fond of insisting made itself felt he won golden opinions in the Kimbrick war while serving under the consul catullus in b c ninety three he at last obtained the praetorship and in the following year held as propraetor the turbulent and newly formed province of cilicia he had been sent there without an army or a proper supply of money yet he made his name feared all around he frightened away mithridates who was trying to annex cappadocia he restored the rightful king of that country and protected him against an armenian invasion first of all romans he came in touch with the formidable parthian power which was just advancing to the line of the upper euphrates he met the ambassador of king arsaces the ninth and not only conjoled him into a friendly agreement but induced him to allow the roman to have the place of honour over the parthian name in their negotiations the great king executed his envoy when he returned for permitting this humiliation of his majesty but the peace between the two powers stood firm in short sulla had pacified south-eastern asia minor and strengthened the boundaries of his province with no other resources than his ready wit his capacity for bluffing orientals and a handful of untrustworthy native auxiliaries his self-confidence never weak is said to have been confirmed by the prophecies of eastern wizards the chief soothsayer of the parthian ambassador was struck by his invariable good fortune cast his horoscope and told him that he was destined to be the greatest of men and that it was strange that he could endure to be anything less at the present moment when sulla returned to rome it was natural that he should take a high place among the optimate party he was the only man among them who had built up a reputation for unvarying success hence he was naturally entrusted with high command in the italian war he fully justified his promotion won battles over the samnites and the lucanians which far surpassed the successes of any other roman general in these campaigns marius not excepted and gained such a reputation that he was elected as consul for b c eighty eight it was natural that when the italian war died down he should be chosen to march against mithridates for he was the only living general who knew the east and had already made a name in that quarter of the world sulla was quite satisfied with the commission he believed that he was competent to save asia and he had been deeply grieved by the humiliations which the roman arms had been suffering in the mithridatic war hence it was that he was moved to ungovernable wrath when he was informed that sulpicius had passed a law to remove him from command and to make over his army to marius he had already been in violent collision with the demagogue who as it is said had tried to get him assassinated in broad daylight during the meeting of the comitia but there is no reason to suppose that he would have interfered with the sword in domestic politics if he had not been deprived of his eastern commission he believed that the turning back of mithridates was a far more important duty than the quelling of demagogues sulpicius had had many predecessors who had all come to a bad end if sufficient rope was given to a turbulent tribune he was certain to end by hanging himself but it was a different matter when he intervened between sulla and his cherished project of reconquering asia and greece from the pontic king when the news reached the consul he behaved in the most unexpected fashion he began by drawing off the greater part of the army from the siege of nola and bringing it up to capua there he harangued the soldiers told them that he was the victim of the intrigues of bad citizens and asked them whether they were prepared to follow him the men were devoted to the general who had led them so well during the italian war they cared little for the difference between optimate and democrat but they remembered that sulla had always been the most indulgent and good-humoured of chiefs that he had kept their stomachs full and their pockets well lined they believed like himself in his luck and they had been looking forward to easy victory and endless plunder in asia the legions shouted that they would follow him anywhere even if he marched against rome itself which was precisely what he was intending to do when the praetors brutus and servilius met him forbidding him to advance further 
the soldiers fell upon them tore their robes broke their fosces and stoned them out of the camp glad to escape with their lives this violence frightened many of sulla's chief officers who slunk away from him lest they should find themselves involved in high treason but the rank and file stuck firmly to him and with thirty thousand men at his back he began a rapid march on rome to those who were appalled at his project he merely said that all the omens were favourable the asiatic moon goddess who had been so friendly to him in cappadocia had appeared to him in a dream and had promised him victory placing a thunderbolt in his hand and bade him use it to annihilate his enemies when this wholly unexpected news reached rome marius and sulpicius sent out several embassies one after another to endeavour to stop sulla but he deceived them by fair words inviting them to induce the senate and the democratic leaders to meet him in a conference while he continued to advance at full speed toward the city as he was approaching it he was joined by his colleague pompeius rufus a very determined optimate whose presence was invaluable to him for when the two consuls acted together it gave a false air of legality to their proceedings marius and sulpicius had barely time to barricade the streets and to arm their followers from the state arsenal when the arrival of the sullen army in the suburbs was reported without the least hesitation the legions crossed the sacred pomerium and pushed into the city the democrats surprised as they were made a desperate resistance but though swords and pikes had been served out to them they were but untrained rioters contending with disciplined soldiery there was fierce fighting around the esquiline market and the temple of tellus but it did not last for long when sulla brought forth torches and told his men to burn out the enemy if they could not expel them in any other fashion the democrats gave way and fled the victors bivouacked that night in the squares and along the streets ready to fight again next morning if necessary but they soon discovered that the leaders of the enemy had left the city and that the mob had dispersed sulla had broken up the dearest traditions of ancient rome he had brought armed legions into the forum to lovers of the constitution whether optimates or democrats it seemed that the abomination of desolation was in the holy place but no thunderbolt descended from heaven to annihilate the impious consul his luck was still with him and he faced the situation which would have appalled any one less cheerful and unscrupulous than himself with perfect equanimity the senate was assembled by the consuls and informed that the tyrants had been expelled from the city it voted that the sulpician laws had been passed without the proper formalities and were null and void it also passed a decree of outlawry by which sulpicius marius and his son and ten other persons were declared public enemies and a price was set on their heads the tribune was caught lurking in a villa at laurentum he was beheaded and his head was set upon the rostra from which he had so often declaimed a ghastly innovation in the etiquette of massacre which was to be regularly followed hereafter but most of the other democratic leaders escaped from italy marius after a long series of adventures culminating in his celebrated mud-bath in the marshes of minternai made his way to africa where he was ultimately joined by his son and several others of the outlaws it would now have been in sulla's power to assume the permanent control of the state he might have proclaimed himself dictator or have renewed his consular authority and have settled down to rule as an autocrat with the swords of his legions propping up his throne but he had no personal ambition he was a roman and an optimate who desired the triumph of his country and his party and was determined to do his best for both but there was nothing of the tyrant in him his present duty as he supposed was to restore his party to power at rome and then to sally forth to save the eastern provinces from mithridates these two ends he proceeded to carry out with no concern for his own private profit the executions as he supposed had crushed the democrats marius he despised and considered a negligible quantity there was no other surviving chief of any note to resuscitate the vanquished faction and the senate ought to be able to take care of itself for the present accordingly he contented himself with making some comparatively unobtrusive changes in the constitution before his departure the chief of these was a law providing that the approval of the senate senatus auctoritas 
had for the future to be granted to any bill brought forward by tribunes or other magistrates before it could be laid before the assembly another law restored the old order of things in the comitia centuriata where the wealthier classes were replaced in the preponderant position which they had enjoyed under the early republic but it was not really by these slight alterations of existing custom that he imagined that the senate could defend itself he left behind for their protection two armies under optimates of assured fidelity and ability his late colleague in the consulship pompeius rufus and quintus metallus pius the son of the conqueror of numidia for the mithridatic war he withdrew from italy only five of his own veteran legions which had served with him throughout the campaigns of b c ninety to eighty eight and had won so many successes over the samnites with this force he thought that he could master all the asiatic hordes of mithridates nor as the event showed was he wrong the moment however that he set out for the east all went wrong in italy he had as it seemed taken his good fortune away with him the senate proved far too weak to maintain the position to which he had restored it and the democratic faction found a new leader in the consul for b c eighty seven lucius cornelius cinna a vain heady man who seems to have been carried away by a sudden lust for establishing a personal domination in the style of gaius gracchus rather than by any true zeal for the popular cause as an optimate no statesman could hope to be more than a member of the governing ring as a democrat it was possible to exercise a quasi-monarchical power hence came the temptation to men of vulgar and unscrupulous ambition to enlist on the democratic side even before sulla left italy his colleague pompeius rufus on whose ability to keep order he most relied had been murdered in a military riot in picanum gnaeus octavius who was consul for b c eighty seven along with cinna proved too weak for the task of controlling his exuberant partner when the latter openly took arms on behalf of the democrats a sporadic civil war began to spread all over italy which became really formidable when cinna made an alliance with the samnites and called back marius and the rest of the exiles the optimates lost ground at last octavius and his army were actually besieged in rome and weakened by desertion and famine the senate capitulated cinna and marius entered rome in triumph and celebrated their victory by a wholesale massacre not a mere attack on a dozen leaders such as sulla had carried out in b c eighty eight marius went about at the head of a band of slaves slaying every man with whom he had ever had a personal quarrel whether he was a prominent politician or not indeed the old general acted more like a lunatic afflicted with homicidal mania than a responsible party leader every prominent man in rome who had not taken sides with the exiles was doomed to death not only was octavius put to death but a number of respectable ex-consuls were murdered among them lucius caesar who had enfranchised the italians in b c ninety catullus the colleague of marius in his cimbrian victory antonius the orator and publius crassus the father of the triumvir the optimate wing of the senate was almost exterminated none escaped save a handful of fugitives and the officers whom sulla had taken with him to the east marius caused the head of every senator who had been slain to be hung up in the forum so that for many weeks it resembled the precinct of the king of daomi after the great customs rather than the meeting-place of a civilized people the atrocities only ceased when marius died on january thirteenth b c eighty six just after he had caused himself to be elected consul for the seventh time cinna glutted with blood now turned from the work of massacre to the more practical task of taking measures for the suppression of sulla who had sailed for the east in the previous year to take up the war against mithridates End of section nine Section ten of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter five Sulla Part two. When Sulla had started from Brundisium for Greece in the spring of BC eighty seven, 
he had taken with him no more than five of his own veteran legions some thirty thousand men at most and a moderate supply of money he had supposed that he might look for a regular supply of recruits and subsidies from the optimate government which he had left behind him at rome he found the eastern provinces in a desperate condition not only had the whole of asia been lost but the pontic armies had crossed into europe and had overrun the greater part of thrace and macedon the fleet of mithridates had subdued the whole of the cyclades and had sacked the great central emporium at delos where twenty thousand italians are said to have been massacred athens had fallen into the hands of the tyrant aristion a humble imitator and admirer of the pontic king nearly all the smaller states of greece had hastened to do homage to the invaders sentius the governor of macedonia and his legate brutius sura with a handful of roman troops were holding out in thessaly but would certainly have been overwhelmed had not sulla come to their aid the great proconsul had marched south from epirus and recovered part of the western regions of greece as far as delphi and the borders of boeotia when he received the appalling tidings of the outbreak of the new democratic rising in italy and of the treason of cinna many men would have turned back to crush the rebels at home before grappling with the external enemies of the state but sulla thought even more of the danger to the roman empire than of the danger of the optimate party instead of returning to italy he pressed with all vigour the campaign against the generals of mithridates without his help octavius and the senate were lost and at midwinter in b c eighty seven to eighty six he learnt that rome was in the hands of the democrats that his friends had been massacred and that he himself and his chief officers had been declared public enemies and outlawed decrees passed at rome to that effect did not much injure him for his army was thoroughly loyal and not a man left him but the dreadful part of the situation was that he had for the future to depend entirely on his own resources he had no money and no fleet the bulk of greece was in the hands of the king's generals and one hundred thousand pontic troops occupied its chief fortresses but sulla showed no sign of discouragement he paid his legions by the desperate expedient of seizing the temple treasures of delphi and olympia to raise a fleet he sent forth his legate lucius lucullus bidding him appeal to all the smaller powers of the east who were frightened by the conquering career of mithridates but the oriental states were cowed and lucullus at first met with many refusals he could only procure a few galleys from the rhodians and the phoenicians with which he could not make any head against the large pontic fleet the armies and supplies of mithridates continued to pass and repass the aegean without hindrance during the first two years of the war but on land where sulla was at work himself things looked better the generals of mithridates were beaten at mount tilphosium in boeotia and pressed back towards athens then the greater part of the greek states sent to ask for terms they had not liked their experiences of the last year while they were under the pontic yoke sulla let them buy safety at a price he wanted money above all things and consented to overlook their treason in consideration of huge fines having secured his rear he proceeded to lay siege to the strongholds of the enemy the city of athens and its port the piraeus they were two fortresses and no longer one for the long walls which had connected them in the days of pericles had disappeared so that their defence was carried out on separate lines the first great episode therefore in sulla's greek campaign of b c eighty seven to eighty six was the double leaguer of athens and the piraeus he had with a very small army for many of his troops were detached in the direction of thessaly to besiege superior numbers in two strong places of which one was perpetually receiving succour from the sea the pontic garrison and the athenians held out with great resolution knowing the massacre that awaited them if they gave way 
the walls were too strong for roman siege craft and the city had to be starved out while at the same time several attempts to relieve it both from the inland and from the side of piraeus had to be beaten back but sulla never despaired and after many months the garrison of athens grew so weak from famine that they failed to guard the circuit of the walls with sufficient care the romans entered by escalade at a point near the dipylon gate and met with little resistance in the streets sulla allowed his men to plunder the place as a reward for their long endurance in the trenches and to put to the sword many of the citizens when at last he ordered the sack to cease he observed that he spared the living for the sake of the dead that is the degenerate athenians of his own day obtained mercy in memory of pericles and plato march first b c eighty six hardly was athens won when a great army of succour over one hundred thousand strong came down from macedonia driving before it the roman corps which had been detached on the side of thessaly sulla hastened up from athens with reinforcements whereupon archelaus the governor of piraeus came round by sea with his garrison and joined his colleague taxiles the armies met at chaeronea one of the inevitable battle spots of greece where an invader advancing from the north can be brought to action in the narrow space between lake copaeus and the phocian foothills sulla had only fifteen thousand foot and less than two thousand horse but he never doubted for a moment of success he had seen asiatic armies before in their own land and had the greatest contempt for them but at first he had some difficulty in bringing over his own men to his opinion they feared the masses of cavalry and the many regiments of mercenaries equipped in the macedonian fashion with the brazen shield and the long sarissa to quiet their minds sulla had to cover his flanks with entrenchments and stockades but presently the men grew tired of the spade and asked to be allowed to fight sulla told them that they should have their will though it seemed that it was not so much courage as dislike for digging that made them so eager the event showed that an oriental army when manfully faced even by very inferior numbers would never stand firm beside a resolute attack of european troops there was much confused fighting but the story of the battle reads like that of the early british victories in india the odds seemed hopeless but the balance of courage compensated for them the scythe chariots of the asiatic turned out as great a fraud as they had been at kunaxa or arbella the legionaries soon learnt their futility they clapped their hands and asked for more as if they had been looking at the races in the circus the unwieldy phalanxes of infantry got into disorder and when the line of pikes was broken fell an unresisting sacrifice to the roman sword only the cavalry of archelaus gave some trouble it pierced the roman line at one point and had to be driven off by hard fighting but seeing his infantry cut to pieces the pontic general rode off the field and escaped we can hardly believe sulla's allegation that he slew one hundred thousand men in this battle more especially when he couples it with the astounding statement that he himself lost but fourteen legionaries of whom two were only missing and turned up next morning even asiatic armies cannot be routed with such a light butcher's bill and the wild lie must have been put about merely to cheer the spirits of the army and inspire them with contempt for the miserable enemy march b c eighty six but just when the subjection of greece seemed complete a new danger fell upon sulla the democrats at rome had just landed an army in epirus under the consul flaccus in order to attack him in the rear for cinna and his friends had not the magnanimity of sulla and would not reserve their swords for the foreigner or defer civil strife till the state was free from external enemies fortunately for the victor of chaeronea flaccus proved a feeble foe as was to be expected from a hero of the forum one whose only achievement had been to pass a disgraceful law which allowed debtors to pay off their liabilities by tendering one-fourth of what they owed to their unfortunate creditors the consul marched into thessaly spreading proclamations which invited the legionaries of sulla to desert the standard of an outlaw and to join 
the legitimate representative of the roman people but when the two armies faced each other near melitia flaccus's raw levies showed no eagerness to fight they began to pass over to sulla whose reputation as a general and notorious liberality impressed their minds the optimate on the other hand could thoroughly rely on his men though he had bought their loyalty by methods of very doubtful morality not only by paying them well but by allowing them to live at free quarters to pillage every place that offered resistance and to maltreat the inhabitants to their heart's content flaccus found his own army much more likely to melt away than that of his rival and hastily sheered off toward macedonia giving out that he would march against mithridates instead of against the optimates this he actually did to the great relief of sulla who not only was relieved of an enemy but saw that enemy doing good work for him by making a diversion in asia for flaccus crossed the hellespont and though he was soon after murdered in a mutiny his successor the demagogue fimbria continued his policy left the optimates alone and began harrying mesia and bithynia but long ere flaccus reached asia sulla was compelled to fight one more great battle in greece while he had been marching into thessaly to face the democrats mithridates had sent reinforcements to join archelaus who after his defeat at chaeronea had taken refuge at chalcis in euboea to watch this great army sulla had fallen back to athens where he spent the winter of b c eighty six to eighty five waiting for the enemy to move on to the mainland for as long as the pontic troops were protected by the channel of the euripus they were unassailable sulla had no fleet to ferry him over the strait and the sea belonged to his adversaries the pontic ships wandered far and wide even as far west as akinthus and there was no roman squadron to keep them in check but in the spring of b c eighty five archelaus had been strengthened by new levies till he had eighty thousand men in hand and he had been sent a colleague named dorylaus who was eager to take the offensive accordingly the pontic army crossed the straits into boeotia and gave sulla the opportunity for which he had been longing his second great battle was fought in the marshy plain near orchomenus only ten miles away from the point where he had won his first victory in the preceding year the decisive engagement was brought about by the romans commencing to run lines across the plain so as to hem in the enemy with their backs to the morasses of lake copaius as sulla had expected this manoeuvre compelled his adversaries to attack him the pontic cavalry came suddenly charging down on the half-completed entrenchments and drove back for a moment the cohorts which were covering the work seeing them give way sulla sprang from his horse seized a standard and ran to the front if any one asks you where you deserted your general he shouted to the recoiling battalions say that it was at orchomenus the taunt recalled them to their duty the line was reformed the reinforcements brought up and in the pitched battle which followed the whole pontic army was hurled into the lake and annihilated even two hundred years after that day writes plutarch bows helms broken mail and swords are still continually discovered in the mud where the fen was once choked with the bodies of the barbarians the whole horde perished only their general archelaus escaped as he had done in the previous year at chaeronea mithridates was now much cowed in spirit all his chosen mercenaries had been destroyed his foothold in europe was lost and he saw the war about to be transferred to asia for lucullus had at last collected a fleet which gave sulla that power of crossing the aegean which he had not hitherto possessed moreover fimbria was already across the hellespont and though his army was small and raw compared with that of sulla it was already giving the king much trouble accordingly he sent to ask for peace offering to abandon all that he had conquered in europe if he was allowed to retain the province of asia he promised in addition to lend the optimates a fleet a great sum of money and an auxiliary army for use against the democrats in italy but sulla was far too good a roman to allow the empire to be shorn of its wealthiest province 
and scorned to march against Cinna at the head of a barbarian force. He rejected the terms proposed to him, and offered the king merely the restoration of the boundaries that had existed before the war. He might keep his ancestral kingdom, but he must evacuate Asia, surrender his fleet, and pay a heavy war indemnity. The Pontic monarch at first thought that these terms were harder than his adversaries had any right to ask. He declared that he would continue the war rather than accept them. Sulla then began to make active preparations for crossing the Aegean. At the same moment, a great number of the states of Ionia, Lydia, and Caria revolted against Mithridates, whose rule had been rapidly becoming unbearable, as his temper grew worse and his financial demands more pressing. Moreover, Fimbria's army had pushed south and occupied Pergamus, after defeating the king's son in a pitched battle. With a sudden descent from swollen pride to abject servility, very characteristic of an oriental prince in his day of trouble, Mithridates sent to tender acceptance of the original terms that had been offered him. He evacuated as much of the Asiatic province as was still in his hands, gave up seventy war galleys, and paid a fine of three thousand talents. He had a formal conference with Sulla at Dardanus in the Troad, where he promised everything that was asked of him, and bore with humility the haughty and trenchant harangue of his conqueror, who told him that he was fortunate to escape so easily as he was now doing after his unprovoked attack on Rome in the day of her necessity, and his wanton massacre of the Italian residents in Asia during the first year of the war. The honour of the Roman name being now fully vindicated and the boundaries of the empire restored, Sulla was at last able to turn against the Democrats. He had first to deal with Fimbria, whose army had pushed southward and was now lying at Thyatea in Lydia. But when he drew near, the soldiers of his adversary refused to bear arms against the saviour and champion of the Roman cause in the east. Their general, seeing his men melting away from him, made an attempt to get Sulla murdered at a conference, and when this miserable plot failed, fell upon his own sword. The submission of Fimbria's legions was a godsend to the Optimates, for Sulla was able to leave them behind to garrison Asia, so that the whole of his own veterans could be utilized for the approaching invasion of Italy. Having completely pacified the East, and carried out in its entirety the program which he had set before himself, when he left Rome in B.C. 87, Sulla now turned to face homeward. He was aware that he had no light task before him. His military chest was full, for he had levied an enormous fine of 20,000 talents on the Asiatic cities, which had joined in the massacre of B.C. 88. But his army was very small. He had no more than his original five legions, kept up with difficulty to their full strength, for Roman recruits were hard to find in the east. Even counting a few mercenary troops which he had levied, he had no more than thirty thousand men, about the same number with which Hannibal had invaded Italy a hundred and thirty-five years before. They seemed but a handful, when it was borne in mind that Cinna could dispose of the resources of the whole peninsula, not to speak of those of the provinces of Gaul, Spain, and Africa but Sulla had three causes for confidence, his own generalship, or as he preferred to call it his luck, the absolute fidelity of his legions, and the knowledge that comparatively few of those who were to be opposed to him were particularly zealous to fight for the democratic cause. In military efficiency, each of his men was worth two or three of the raw recruits with whom they would have to deal, and what soldier was likely to desert the general, who had been giving him of late no less than sixteen denarii a day, just thirty-two times the normal pay of the Roman legionary. Sulla gave his enemies fair warning of his intentions. Before he set sail he sent a dispatch to Rome, in which he laid before the Senate a detailed account of his four successful years of campaigning in Greece and Asia. He then announced that he was approaching to chastise those who had been guilty of the massacres of the winter of b c eighty seven to eighty six not to harm the roman people he should not meddle with the rights of the newly enfranchised italian citizens 
nor should he do any wilful damage to italy he was the enemy not of the many but of the few and only those who had blood on their hands need fear him such a declaration was well suited to frighten the democratic government at rome for cinna and his friends knew that they were no longer popular with the country at large their three years of rule had been a disastrous failure it started with a bloody massacre which alienated every citizen of moderate mind then when constructive measures were necessary the famous democratic program had ended in a fiasco cinna had no genius in him and the code of laws which he produced turned out to be no more than a rechauffe of the out-of-date expedients of sulpicius and the gracchi which had already been tried and found wanting the one startling novelty had been the dishonest debt law of valerius flaccus which as we have already mentioned permitted those who owed money to demand a receipt in full from their creditors when they had paid one-fourth of what they had borrowed it may be guessed what was the effect of this law on the money-lending equites who had hitherto been staunch supporters of the democratic cause cinna and his friends in short had staked their success on their power to satisfy all italy and to provide a purer and more efficient government than that of the old senatorial oligarchy in this they had notoriously failed so far from being a return to the golden age the three years domination of the democratic party had been a time of massacre bankruptcy and discontent the chiefs of the dominant faction had proved windbags and dishonest windbags too of all the men who emerged as leaders in these troublous years none showed the least sign of genius save the praetor quintus sertorius the rest were noisy rather than energetic and bloodthirsty rather than resolute indeed the only men who fought with zeal against sulla were those who had compromised themselves in the massacre and knew that they were beyond the hope of pardon sulla's great advantage then was that he and his followers meant business while the majority of those arrayed against him were lukewarm but still the odds seemed so desperate in point of mere numbers that it was thought that his little army would be overwhelmed cinna had one hundred thousand men enrolled in b c eighty four and in the next year it is said that his successors hurried double that number into the field but few were eager for the fray it seemed that they were to be sacrificed to save the necks of their leaders not to defend italy for sulla kept asserting that he came as a friend to every one but the fanatics who had murdered his friends raised his house to the ground and declared him a public enemy noting the slackness of the people in the army the majority in the senate who felt themselves less compromised than their leaders voted that an embassy should be sent to sulla to see if he could not be reconciled and brought home without a war but when amid many protestations of his moderation and good intentions the proconsul answered that he must bring his army at his back to give him security and that the guilty must be punished it was evident that there was no way of avoiding the struggle cinna meanwhile had been seized with the idea that the best way to keep sulla out of italy would be to attack him in greece he collected an army at ancona with the intention of crossing over into epirus the first cohort sailed but when the main body was ordered to embark in very stormy weather the men mutinied cinna came hurrying down to appease them but was received by a volley of stones and beaten to death the control of his party fell into the hands of men even less capable than himself the chief of whom were his colleague the consul papirius carbo marius the son of the great general and lucius junius brutus Damasippus the democratic party had no longer a single autocratic leader cinna's three consulships had been styled a dominatio and almost a tyranny but was ruled by a council of war destitute of any commanding personality end of section ten section eleven of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. 
sulla part three in the spring of b c eighty three sulla landed in safety at brundisium which opened its gates without opposition an event of evil augury for the democrats it was his object to show from the first that he came as the friend of italy and the enemy only of those who had proscribed him all through his first campaign he was fighting with his brains as much as with his sword by proclamations no less than by battles he began by granting the brundisians immunity from all taxation as a reward for their surrender as he marched through apulia he kept his army in such order that neither man nor beast cottage nor cornfield was harmed yet it must have been hard to hold in veterans accustomed to the plunder of the east wherever he came he announced that there was full amnesty and pardon for every one who did not actually appear in arms against him this conduct had the most marked effect on the hostile army from the very first the democratic legions showed great lukewarmness in the cause of their commanders the two consuls for the new year gaius norbanus and lucius cornelius scipio were entrusted with the opening of the campaign against the invader they were both very incompetent officers and foolishly separated their armies by such a wide gap that sulla was able to deal with them in detail norbanus was defeated near canusium in apulia he hastily fell back across the apennines but received a second beating at mount tifada after which he shut himself up in capua his colleague scipio marched to his aid but his army was dispersed more by intrigue than by fighting for sulla proposed an armistice and took advantage of it to tamper with the consul's men who when the resumption of hostilities was proclaimed refused to fight part of them dispersed part went over to sulla and scipio fell into the hands of his enemy still maintaining his ostentatious affectation of magnanimity the latter sent him away unharmed giving him an escort as far as the nearest democratic camp he then returned to blockade the army of norbanus the democrats complained as plutarch tells us that in contending with sulla they had to fight at once with a lion and a fox and the fox gave the more trouble of the two sulla's first successes emboldened the surviving members of the optimate party who had escaped the sword of marius and had been lurking ever since in obscure hiding places to take up arms the senior in rank was the proconsul quintus metellus pius but by far the most able were two young men gnaeus pompeius and marcus crassus each of whom had to avenge a father slain in the civil war the one in a mutiny the other in the great massacre of b c eighty seven both were active enterprising and fortunate pompeius gathered in picanum where his family was popular a tumultuary force that gradually swelled to three legions crassus levied a small army in the martian territory these insurrections distracted the attention of the democrats who were forced to turn against them a considerable portion of their new levies and had in consequence less men to oppose to sulla it thus came to pass that the proconsul found himself strong enough to march on rome when the spring of b c eighty two came round he planned a diversion on the east side of italy where metellus and pompey made such a bold advance that carbo with the main army of the democrats went off to hold them in check leaving the younger marius with forty thousand men to guard latium in the appian way when sulla started for a sudden rush on rome he found only this latter army in his path at sacra portus near signia he inflicted a crushing defeat on the young general who was a brave soldier but no tactician the optimates were much outnumbered but the slackness of the rank and file among their enemies gave them every advantage in the thick of the fight five cohorts threw down their standards and went over to sulla this broke the line the enemy fled and marius only succeeded in saving a fraction of his host within the walls of the fortress of praeneste the road to rome was open and sulla marched hastily on the city he occupied it without having to strike a blow 
but found to his disgust that he was too late to prevent a fresh massacre on getting news of the defeat at sacraportus the praetor lucius brutus damasippus had laid violent hands on every person in the city who was suspected of sympathizing with the optimates mucius scywola the pontifex maximus and many other respectable men perished in this disgraceful slaughter after the fall of rome sulla's star was manifestly in the ascendant and he possessed the obvious advantage of appearing to be the legal representative of the people since he could compel the senate and the comitia to vote whatever he pleased the war assumed a very confused and chaotic aspect for fighting was now going on all over italy and each side had dispersed its main force in the endeavour to seize or to hold as many important districts as was possible but the whole business came to a head on november first b c eighty two while sulla was facing carbo in etruria and young marius was still being besieged in praeneste the enemy made a vigorous attempt to seize rome a division detached by carbo made a junction behind sulla's back with the national levy of the samnites who were helping the democrats more in the character of independent allies than in that of roman citizens gaius pontius of Telesia, a namesake of the ancient hero of the caudine forks led his countrymen to join damasippus and carinus the whole mass came rushing down from the apennines upon the city which the samnites intended to sack rather than to save sulla received news of this concentration in his rear so late that he almost despaired of arriving in time rome was within an ace of destruction for the vanguard of the optimate cavalry arrived when the enemy was only two miles from the gates if their generals had pushed forward a little farther on the preceding night october thirty first instead of encamping close to the city they would have found no one to oppose them as it was sulla's legions had to be placed in line directly they arrived after a fatiguing night march and without being granted time to take a proper meal the battle that followed was far the fiercest of the whole civil war for sulla had to deal not with the lukewarm levies of carbo but with the sturdy samnites pontius rode round his army crying as wellius tells us that rome's last day had come that the tyrant city must be destroyed to her foundations that the roman wolves the bane of italian liberty would never be got rid of until their lair was laid waste the armies met outside the colline gate on the northern side of the city the optimate legions being ranged with their back to the walls and only a few hundred yards from them sulla had the left wing his lieutenant marcus crassus the right for some hours the fortune of the day was hardly contested crassus gained ground but sulla's own division was pressed backward till some of the cohorts were crushed against the walls and others vainly tried to re-enter the gates which were closed against them by the citizens the general himself was in imminent danger of death those who were near him saw him draw from his breast the little golden figure of apollo which he always wore kiss it and mutter to the god that it would be a scurvy trick if he allowed sulla the lucky to fall at last on his own threshold by the hands of traitors apollo was not unpropitious the wreck of sulla's wing held out at the foot of the walls till the night fell soon after the news came that crassus had completely routed the forces opposed to him which seems to have been mainly composed of the democratic levies of damasippus and carinus not of samnites this caused the enemy to draw off from sulla their general pontius had been mortally wounded and it seems that there was no capable man to take his place at dawn the two optimate divisions joined and swept away the dislocated forces of their opponents one democratic legion came over to sulla's side the rest dispersed but not so quickly but that eight thousand of them were captured in their flight the generals damasippus martius and carinus suffered the same fate on the next day sulla cut off their heads and sent them to praeneste to be exhibited to young marius and his famishing garrison the dreadful sight had its effect marius committed suicide and praeneste surrendered 
the victors sorted out the romans from among the prisoners beheaded those of senatorial rank but let the rest go free the italians were all put to death to the number of several thousands the same fate had already befallen the captives taken at the colline gate eight thousand of them all save the roman rank and file were slain in the circus maximus which had been utilized as their prison the senate sitting hard by in the temple of bologna heard the shrieks and groans of the victims and showed signs of terror but sulla bid them stick to their business and not allow themselves to be distracted it was only some malefactors who were suffering the reward of their crimes there was still much fighting to be done in italy carbo deserted his army in etruria and fled overseas but his partisans held out for some time in isolated bands norba and nola stood long sieges and volaterrae held out for the incredible length of two years but the main war in italy practically came to an end with the victory of the colline gate and the fall of Praeneste. The struggle after that date mainly consisted of the savage harrying of Samnium and Etruria, the two districts where the Democratic Party had made itself most strong. Leaving the completion of this guerrilla warfare to his lieutenants, Sulla had set himself to the great work of his latter years, the remodeling of the Roman constitution on an oligarchical basis with this object he had himself appointed dictator in november eighty two but a dreadful preliminary to his political work was his great proscription the formal revenge for what marius and cinna had done in b c eighty seven to eighty six down to the moment of his victory it was said he showed himself a far more moderate and humane man than could have been expected after it was won he was more cruel than could have been believed possible he spared indeed the rank and file of the roman democrats but he systematically cut off every man of note in their party it seemed that he was determined that not one leader should survive to rally the partisans of the lost cause he started his operations by issuing three long lists of persons on whose heads a price was set the first contained eighty names the second and third two hundred and twenty each he then coolly gave notice that he had condemned every one whom he could remember but that those whom he had forgotten should be put into supplementary catalogues these dreadful appendices kept coming out for many weeks and not till they ceased could any roman who had not taken the optimate side feel himself secure many comparatively obscure names crept into the lists for the generals and favourites of sulla often got him to insert their personal enemies among the executed he himself seems to have been as impervious to corruption as to pity but those about him were not and all sorts of old grudges were paid off under a pretence of political vengeance in all some fifty senators sixteen hundred equites and at least two thousand private persons were executed in the sullen proscriptions the heads of the fallen were exhibited in the forum according to the disgusting custom which had begun at the death of sulpicius their property was confiscated and their children and grandchildren were declared of tainted blood and incapable of holding any public office the sons of the proscribed formed a well-known group of malcontents during the next generation on account of this disability which was now laid upon them but the proscription was only in sulla's estimation a necessary preliminary to the great work of reconstruction which he had taken in hand he had resolved to rearrange the whole constitution with the definite object of transferring the sovereignty of the state from the people to the senate we have already pointed out that in the roman politics of the last fifty years the main difficulty that lay at the bottom of all disputes was the quarrel for sovereignty should the senate according to recent usage or the tribes according to ancient constitutional theory be the body that really ruled the city and the empire senatus populusque romanus was a sounding phrase but neither optimates nor democrats had any love for the mutual interdependence which the words postulated now sulla thought that all the troubles of the time came from the fact 
that neither senate nor people had full sovereignty and as a consistent oligarch and a conscientious party man he was determined to put the balance of power to an end by conferring complete autocratic authority on his own senatorial order the optimates had during the last fifty years suffered from three different sorts of foes from unruly tribunes galvanizing into spasmodic life the cumbrous but all-powerful machinery of the comitia from over-great magistrates like marius or cinna who renewed their power from year to year and kept an army at their backs and from the newly created equestrian order the body of financiers fighting for their own interests by the power of the purse however sordid and anti-national these interests might be sulla's laws so far as they dealt with things political resolved themselves into an ingenious and systematic attempt to break down the power of all these three enemies of the state the comitia tributa and its tribunes the great magistrates and the equites if all three were politically annihilated there would be for the future no check on the omnipotence of the senate the dictator's object was to combine the maximum of real with the minimum of formal change for though he was himself completely emancipated from that slavish respect for the letter of the constitution which swayed the average roman he knew that this was the case neither with his friends nor with his enemies the hardest blows were aimed at the most powerful enemies the tribunes and the comitia tributa whose power of issuing and repealing any laws that they pleased had been the greatest danger to the senate as long as any democratic tribune could bring forward whatever laws he chose and as long as such laws when passed by the plebeian assembly became binding on the state there was no security against a reaction which might annul the whole of the cornelian laws the moment that their author should have passed away sulla's action against the comitia was very ingenious he made no pretense of abolishing it or of abrogating the omnipotence of such bills as it might pass he only determined that no dangerous bill should ever come before it this was accomplished by reviving and making indisputably valid the old claim of the senate that every law should of right be laid before them and receive their auctoritas or certificate of legality before the tribune introduced it to the assembly now obviously such bills as the senate would pass on as harmless and useful would be measures that did not cut short their own authority or clash with their ideas of expediency sulla therefore compelled the comitia to pass a law which made the grant of a senatus auctoritas a necessary preliminary for the production of a law before the people henceforth as he hoped there would be no chance of tiresome and dangerous bills for land redistribution or corn doles or grants of abnormal powers to magistrates being passed by the assembly all such schemes if broached in the senate would be stifled there and go no farther no measure of a democratic complexion would ever reach the comitia all that the people would be able to do would be to reject bills sent down to them with the senatorial sanction if they had the pluck to contradict the governing power in the state their power of initiation would be gone thus reduced to impotence the assembly was no longer an object of dread to sulla and for that reason he did not think it worth while to abolish it or even to turn out from it the hordes of italians whom cinna had thrust into the midst of the old citizens he made no attempt either to confine them to a few tribes or to suspend their franchise thus he kept to the letter of the promise which he had made to the new citizens when he landed at brundisium personally as an old aristocrat sulla probably felt much less contempt for the italians than for the original plebs urbana what he thought of the freedmen who were so prominent a feature in that body may be guessed from the fact that he not only put them all back into the four city tribes but actually foisted in among them in a single day no less than ten thousand voters of the lowest class enfranchised slaves of those who had fallen in his own proscription they all took him as their patron and adopted his name of cornelius which was henceforth one of the commonest appellations in the slums <laughs>
to destroy completely the powers of the plebeian assembly as an element in the constitution it was necessary not merely to subordinate its legislative functions to those of the senate but to cut short the dangerous and anarchical privileges of its presiding magistrates the tribunes some legislators would have abolished the tribunate altogether and considering the way in which tiberius gracchus and saturninus had used it there would have been a fair excuse for doing so sulla however merely resolved that he would invent rules which should for the future keep tribunes out of mischief it was not enough that a senatus auctoritas should be required for any bill that they might bring forward he determined that they should for the future be non-entities men unlikely to disturb the state by their personal ascendancy or ambition this end was secured by the ingenious law which provided that for the future the acceptance of the tribunate should be a complete bar to the holding of any subsequent magistracy in the state the man who chose to be a tribune would put himself out of the running for any further political promotion but in spite of this disability it was conceivable that an ambitious man might become tribune with the intention not of sacrificing any external career but of being perpetually re-elected to this office like gaius gracchus of old sulla provided against this possibility by repealing the law of b c one twenty nine which had made it legal for a man to hold the tribunate in successive years he enacted that tribunes and as we shall see other magistrates also should not be chosen again without an interval of ten years between their two tenures of the post thus it was secured that for the future no man of more than fifth-rate ambition would become a tribune since by putting in for a nomination he cut himself off from all hope of a brilliant and continuous public career but even the nobodies who would now hold the office were not to be left shackled only by their own nothingness sulla gave the senate a power of fining the tribunes for any conduct that it might consider illegal or unbecoming so that they had to live in awe of the governing body all their days if they held too many noisy public meetings or dared to use their veto freely they might find themselves saddled with a crushing penalty and reduced to poverty the only power in short which remained untouched among the tribunes privileges was that which he had been given when the office was first invented in the days of the early republic the jus auxilii ferendi or right to intervene in behalf of the individual roman citizen who might be suffering oppression having dealt thus with the tribunes and the assembly sulla had next to take in hand the second power in the state which was dangerous to the sovereignty of the senate that of the individual magistrates according to the theory of the roman constitution the consul or praetor deriving his authority directly from the people because he had been elected by them in the comitia centuriata had a very independent position in face of the senate that body indeed had in early days been nothing more than the band of advisers chosen by the consul whose monitions he was equally free to accept or reject even in these latter times a headstrong consul could practically disregard the voice of the senate for his whole term of office and if he was chosen for several years in succession he could go on administering things much as he pleased without being restrained to any appreciable extent such had been the position of marius during the years of the cimbric war and of cinna in b c eighty six to eighty four sulla therefore had to guard against the ambition of the magistrates of the future his main weapon for this end was his lex annalis this law provided that all the offices of the state must be taken in strict rotation first the quaestorship then the praetorship and lastly the consulate no one was to hold two offices in successive years and the different limits of age prescribed for each secured that a considerable time must elapse between the tenure of them otherwise of course an ambitious politician might by taking aedileship praetorship and consulate in successive years get a long spell of continuous power and make himself permanently disagreeable to the senate much less was it to be permitted that any magistrate should hold the same office continuously one of sulla's ordinances was to the effect 
that there must be a gap of no less than ten years before a man could be re-elected to the same post we have already come across this provision when dealing with the tribunate there would therefore no longer be any place in the constitution for a marius or a cinna but in the true oligarchic style each man would get his turn and no man more than his turn every politician would be able to calculate with precision when he ought to hold each office without the danger arising that some interloper of genius might swoop down and monopolize the series of praetorships or consulships that ought to have been divided among half a dozen minor persons End of section eleven section twelve of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter five sulla part four it is curious to note that sulla with all his astuteness overlooked one fact that an ambitious proconsul in a province at the head of an army might be quite as troublesome to the senate as an ambitious consul at rome proposing laws to the people yet his own career ought to have taught him that a governor in greece or gaul with half a dozen faithful legions was the greatest danger of all he did realize the peril as it would seem but merely provided against it by enacting that any imperator who crossed the frontier of his province at the head of an army or refused to quit it within a month of his successor's arrival should become ipso facto a public enemy this no doubt clearly defined high treason but it gave no sufficient security against it the republic was ultimately to be overthrown by an adventurer of this kind by a provincial governor who dared to cross the rubicon whatever might be the legal consequence because he was well aware that his legions would follow him against any enemy whom he might choose to indicate to them the real remedy against this peril would have been to separate the military from the civil command in each province to have a governor who was merely an administrator and a commander-in-chief who reported directly to the senate but this plan does not seem to have entered into the dictator's mind sulla made a large increase in the number of the annual magistrates raising the praetors to eight and the quaestors to twenty but it is improbable that he intended as some have supposed to decrease the importance of each office by multiplying the numbers of those who held it incidentally this result might follow but it is probable that the dictator was merely studying the convenience of the state for till his day the administration was decidedly undermanned nor again does it seem to be true that he deliberately deprived the consuls of their military power for their year of office by arranging that they should stay in rome where no legions would be at their disposal and only utilize their imperium when they went out as proconsuls to their provinces in the succeeding year the usage that the consul should remain at home unless urgent military matters drew him out of italy had already begun to grow up before sulla's time and on the other hand there are a few cases after his death in which the consul left the city and assumed command of an army before his year had expired for example this was certainly done by cotta and lucullus in the first year of the third mithridatic war it would seem that sulla made the quaestorship qualify its holder for a seat in the senate so that the governing body of the state was no longer filled up by the censors but recruited automatically from the influx of young magistrates in this way he abolished the necessity for a censorship and made the senate independent of the likes and dislikes of individual holders of that office having thus muzzled the tribunes and curbed the consuls sulla had next to deal with the third enemy of the senate the equestrian order it will be remembered that a disproportionate share of the massacre of the fourth proscription had fallen upon them no less than sixteen hundred had been put to death so that the democratic wing of the knighthood had been almost exterminated at the other end of the line sulla had promoted a very large number of equites of optimate views to a seat in the senate so that in legislating against the body he was not striking at his own friends 
his object was to loosen the bonds which held together the rather heterogeneous classes which formed the equestrian order these bonds were firstly their honorary privileges the augusti clave toga the gold ring and the rows of reserved seats in circus and theatre secondly their monopoly of the control of the jury courts which they had used so unscrupulously as a weapon against the senate and the provincial magistrates thirdly their tax-farming privileges especially the most profitable enactment of gaius gracchus which handed over the collecting of the tithes of asia to the societates sulla therefore launched a whole series of measures against the equestrian order one bill took away the entire control of the law courts from them and restored it to the senators once more the latter became the only persons eligible as jurymen as in the days before gaius gracchus they could look forward to being tried by a friendly instead of a hostile court if they incurred prosecution and were able to audit their own accounts inside the family the equites suffered but not the empire for the previous state of things had been so bad that any change must have profited the provincials a second bill put an end to the system of tax farming in asia and imposed on each of its cities a fixed tribute instead of the tithes this was an enormous boon to the asiatics but probably the way in which the measure commended itself to sulla's mind had nothing to do with their point of view he made the change because it would be unpalatable to the knights who lost an unparalleled source of money-making when the tax-farming disappeared we may compare him to the puritans of old who abolished bear-baiting not because it was cruel to the bear but because it gave so much pleasure to the audience yet another bill of which the details have unfortunately perished would seem to have deprived the equites of many of their honorary privileges especially of their seats in the circus these they did not recover to the law of roscius otto restored them in b c sixty seven there were many other cornelian laws outside the three great groups with which we have been dealing one abolished the corn dole a most admirable measure for which we should admire the dictator more if we could only suppose that he was acting on economic reasons and not merely doing his best to disoblige the urban multitude others systematized the organization of the law courts which had hitherto been arranged in a very haphazard fashion very prominent among his innovations was the law which added new courts for the trial of criminal offences quaestiones perpetuae to those already existing so that every form of offence had for the future its proper venue but of these legal matters we have no leisure to speak nor need we say much concerning his colonial schemes he settled many of his veterans in etruria and samnium on the lands of the cities which he had destroyed for obstinate adherence to the democratic cause but he can hardly have expected his colonies to prove economic successes considering the character of the settlers who had long been estranged from the soil and the indisputable fact that farming had long ceased to pay in central italy they were no doubt merely intended to last out sulla's own day and to supply him for a time with a compact block of adherents accustomed to arms and cantoned in the close vicinity of rome it is a curious commentary on the wisdom of the step that ruined sullen veterans formed sixteen years later an appreciable element in the army of catiline sulla as every one knows laid down his dictatorship in january b c seventy nine after holding it for two years when he had passed all his long code of constitutional enactments and had seen the last embers of civil war die down he laid aside the trappings of power and retired into private life he had no personal ambition and when his work was finished and the new constitution had been set going he resolved to let it have the chance of a fair start without the danger of overbalance caused by the perpetual presence of his own mighty personality for the sullen regime had in it no place for sullas the whole scheme of laws had been framed to keep down over great men and he was well aware that he was himself over great as a conscientious oligarch it was his duty to remove himself from power and to resign the abnormal office that he had held 
throughout b c eighty one and eighty his function for the future was to stand by outside the machine to watch it work and to step in to lend his aid if ever it showed signs of getting out of gear his notion of how the new constitution could best be maintained may be gathered from the curious story of the death of lucretius ofella that distinguished officer the captor of Prineste, so far presumed on his late services that he boldly proposed to break sulla's lex annalis by standing for the consulate before he had held the praetorship sulla gave him fair warning that he would not be allowed to take the office but he refused to listen and made a formal canvass in the form after the usual style while ofella was going his rounds with his white toga in the crowded market-place his chief quietly told two centurions to cut him down they did so and when an uproar began sulla stepped forward to take all the blame and responsibility and to offer to stand his trial for murder no one dared to come forward as a prosecutor and so he got off scot-free the story has several morals clearly the constitution was still so weak that an ambitious man could venture to attack it ere it was but two years old only sulla himself could defend it but as long as he survived it was safe if he could have looked forward to twenty years of life he might have dragooned the roman people into an acceptance of it but he was already elderly and ailing innovators should start young and live long like the emperor augustus what would have happened to the imperial system if augustus had died at the age of forty instead of living on till he was seventy-six no doubt sulla's constitution was doomed from the first to failure but at any rate the experiment of restoring the oligarchy was worth trying the opposite political device of the democrats that of endeavouring to transact all the business of the city and the empire in the comitia had proved utterly impracticable under sinna's domination such a regime had been working for nearly four years with the most deplorable results the popular programme had been tried and found wanting it had run to nothing more than corn largesses and the repudiation of debts at the touch of the sword the democratic government had fallen to pieces merely because it commanded neither respect nor affection from any quarter sulla's scheme to set up a senate unhampered by any other power in the state and possessing full and complete sovereignty was at least equally worth a trial it failed no doubt mainly from the want of men able and willing to work the system when the old dictator had passed away for he left behind him a senate most unfitted to carry on his great plan not a number of men of good average ability each ready to take his turn of duty and power and not desirous of grasping it more but quite the opposite sort of assembly a multitude of non-entities and incapables mixed with a few ambitious young generals the heart and core of the old optimate party had perished in the marian massacres in spite of all its faults the senate down to the days of the civil war had always contained a certain number of men of mark and respectability persons such as antonius the orator catullus the victor over the cimbri crassus the father of the triumvir the consuls octavius and merula all these had been slain by marius and cinna of the optimate senators none survived save those who had been protected by their own insignificance and the few who had been absent with sulla in greece when the civil war broke out the reconstructed senate of b c eighty one therefore was mainly composed of a mass of trivial and unimportant persons whose nothingness had caused them to escape sinna's eye but seated among them were the military men who had come to the front during the fighting such as ofella crassus and pompey these young generals as was but natural were not content to take their single turn of power and office in company with a herd of nobodies they were ambitious and yearned for the carriere ouverte au talon in which the able man could not only reach the front but stay there the slow oligarchic rotation which sulla had invented was odious to them and they were in the end driven to overthrow the new constitution in order that they might be able to assert themselves over the mediocrities there was no resisting power among the majority 
no true heir of sulla's breed survived to bind them together and to rally them to fight in behalf of the oligarchic system so the great dictator's constitution fell almost undefended only ten years after it had been created this at any rate was not sulla's fault he did his best with the material set before him he constructed the first logical and well-planned constitution that rome had ever known a triumph of ingenuity because it changed the essentials while leaving the external features still in existence it was a thoroughly practical scheme for the governance of city and empire by a pure oligarchy if it failed it was because the machine was cleverly built but its mainspring was not strong enough to keep the wheels moving that is it demanded that the average senator should attain a certain moderate level of courage capacity and patriotism but the fathers as a body were lacking in all these three essentials in the hands of the senators of the third century before christ the sullen constitution could have been worked but in b c eighty the motive power was too weak through no fault of sulla's and the machine was bound to run down as long as he stood beside it to give the pendulum an occasional swing the clock continued to go when he died it ticked feebly for a short time and then stopped it was ruinous to the oligarchy that sulla should have survived only a little more than a year after he laid down the dictatorship for himself his early death was probably not so unfortunate it saved him from many disappointments even before he died he had suffered one at least in seeing marcus lepidus elected to the consulship contrary to his expressed desire but on the whole his last year was one of prosperity for the first time for many a long day he was free from the cares of office and could live as he pleased his powers of enjoyment do not seem to have been the least impaired by advancing years he had still to make up for that youth spent in involuntary frugality just before he laid down the dictatorship he had married a young wife the story of their first meeting as told by plutarch gives an amazing picture of the light-heartedness of the man who had just waded through all the blood of the proscriptions the dictator was one day presenting the people with a show of gladiators and it chanced that a lady of great beauty and good family sat close behind sulla her name was valeria the daughter of Massala and the sister of hortensius the orator she had lately divorced her first husband this lady coming gently behind sulla pinched off a thread from the edge of his toga and then passed back to her seat but he much amazed at the familiarity looked round at her whereupon she said do not wonder sir at what i have done i had only a mind to get a shred of your good luck sulla was far from being displeased on the contrary it appeared that he was agreeably flattered for he sent to ask her name and to inquire into her family then followed all through the games the exchange of side looks and smiles which ended ultimately in a contract of marriage now it seems to me that sulla though he got a wife of great beauty and accomplishments came into the match on wrong principles for like a boy he was caught with soft looks and languishing airs sulla's last year was spent in his villa in campania near putioli whither he retired and dwelt amid a court of clever and dissolute companions who kept him amused he devoted his time partly to writing his memoirs he finished the twenty-second book of them two days before he died partly to pleasures reputable and disreputable of all sorts the tale that his last months were vexed with a loathsome disease which rendered life insupportable is probably an invention of his enemies it has been attributed to half a dozen well-hated tyrants the last of whom was philip the second of spain but it is certain that sulla died from breaking a blood vessel rather than from any lingering ailment in the leisure of his last year he found time for business he kept a keen eye on roman affairs and drafted a constitution for the neighbouring town of putioli at the request of its inhabitants his last recorded act was a strange and violent interference in politics which much recalls the story of Ophella. the quaestor granius was making himself notorious by embezzlements and openly said that he should escape punishment because the ex-dictator was dying sulla lured him to his bedside by a polite message and then had him seized and strangled in his very presence by his slaves the excitement of the scene caused him to rupture a blood-vessel and he died of exhaustion next day
his party being still in power he received the most magnificent funeral that rome had ever seen his monument was erected in the most conspicuous part of the campus martius and two centuries later was still visible plutarch says that it bore a curious and characteristic epitaph composed by the dictator himself in which he said that no friend ever did him so much good or enemy so much harm but that he had repaid him with full interest End of section twelve